Hello? Yeah, this is Bob. Yeah. No, I got one bar. I'm lucky I can hear you. I'm on 23rd Street. That's the Flatiron Building. But guess what? It's 1906. Yeah, well, it's interesting, sure, but there's not a lot to do here. I mean, the shows are very silly, and there's no television. But you are lucky. You can watch Media Reporter if you stay tuned right now. That horse really stinks. Well, I'm certainly glad to be back from 1906. I'm going to take you back in time again, not quite as far, to the year 2000. We had an interesting discussion about the Second Amendment, which is gun control versus the right to bear arms. With us, we had James H. Warner from the National Rifle Association and the Honorable Judge Gerald Leibovitz, who discussed the different points. The host was Jennifer Tierney Reed. We hope you enjoy this program from our archives. From the heart of downtown Manhattan's legal district, New York Law is proud to present Gun Control versus the Right to Bear Arms. In 1791, this is what a handgun looked like. It was capable of killing, but not on the mass level that many of today's weapons are. So to determine whether the right to bear arms is able to survive in a modern context, one must look to the language of the Second Amendment, which reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of the free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. To look at the scope of the Second Amendment, we have two distinguished guests with us here today. On my right is Jim Warner, who serves as Assistant General Cam Counsel to the National Rifle Association. And on my left is New York Law School professor, Joe Lebovitz, who is advisor to the school's Moot Court Association, which argues constitution constitutional issues in competition with other law schools. And I want to start with Jim. It seems that the Second Amendment is unique among constitutional provisions in a sense that it contains its own mini preamble, which sets forth its purpose mm -hmm. to foster a well-regulated militia. Mm -hmm. And this wording has set the stage for the original intent debate as to whether or not the right to bear arms is a collective right or an individual right. right. And many argue that the Second Amendment was only intended um, to have state militias protect themselves mm -hmm. from the newly created federal government. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to that argument? Well, first of all, uh, there, there's really two questions. The first is whether there is a right to bear arms, and second, what the Second Amendment means. Now, it's very clear that uh, there, there are parts of the Second Amendment that are clear. There are parts that are not. When construing an ambiguous law, the first thing you want to do is see where the ambiguity is. There is no doubt, because one of the canons is that you must give effect, if possible, so that it's not to create surplusage. You must give effect to everything. So it is very clear that the Second Amendment has some meaning. There, it's reasonably clear that it protects some right. The question, there, there are two ambiguities. The first question is as to whom this right pertains. Who owns this right, whether it is the collective or the individual. And the second question, uh, a minor question, uh, because it's not as ambiguous, is who, uh, upon whom this prohibition rests. You know, in the First Amendment it says Congress shall make no law. Right. The Second Amendment merely says shall not be infringed. And in, in, now my personal belief is that this was intended to protect an individual right. But I, I find the argument that it protects a collective right to be interesting because if this is true, it means that, and, and the anti-federalists were concerned about uh, federal government control over the militia. So it must mean, if this is a, uh, intended to defend a collective right, it must mean that the purpose of this is either to nullify completely and repeal, or at least partially repeal, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 and 16, calling forth the militia and Congress's uh, power to uh, set the rules uh, to arm and set the rules of discipline for the militia. And uh, Article uh, 1, Section 10, that pro prohibits uh, states from having a standing army or uh, ships of war without permission of Congress. 
Now, if it, if, if it repeals these, including the rules for arming the militia and the discipline of the militia, that means that the states can do whatever they want about this. Incidentally, uh, the Perpich case uh, recently, uh, th that was one in which several state governors challenged the right of the federal government to uh, send the militia, send the National Guard to Central America for training. That would have to be wrongly decided for this to be a, a, a collective right. But if it's a collective right, it means that the states have the right to determine without any, at their absolute discretion, without any interference or any interpretation by the federal government, what the rules for the militia will be. And it is very clear now that, that at least that this part has to apply to the federal government since it's federal law. The militia is everyone between the ages of uh, 18 and, uh, and 45. And therefore, since the states have not, at least the state of Maryland has not chosen to issue firearms to me or to my neighbors, uh, it is implicit, I think, in the structure of the uh, federal law and the militia and, and uh, the fact that the states can't, uh, don't have the mon money to equip us. That, and traditionally, uh, the militia always had to supply their own arms that uh, it is expected that this collectivity would be armed by the people themselves, the people would supply their own arms in this collective, uh, co collective right. If that's the case, it means that federal laws, such as the National Firearms Act, uh, can't be enforced because it would, not, it would give the federal government some power to determine what arms the militia could have in the states. Now, a state could say, you can't have this, that, as, as they've done in New York City, for example. There's certain, uh, certain names you can't write on guns in New York City and certain appearances you can't have, and certain functional types of firearms you can't have. And a state might have that authority if this is a collective right. But the federal government does not. The federal government can't tax. Uh, remember McCulloch versus Maryland, uh, the, the, the power to tax is the power to destroy. So you can't tax, even though the National Firearms Act puts a $200 tax on uh, certain types of firearms, uh, that, that, since some of these would be useful to a military, uh, in fact, we issue them to our armed forces, uh, they, they couldn't tax them because that would restrict against what the collective right would be, the power of the uh, states. Now, so you, you believe that it confers an individual it is, right? It confers an individual right, but just in case it does not, uh, it, it, uh, in my view, would, if it confers, a, if, now it doesn't confer, it protects. The Bill of Rights confers nothing. Right. I also want to get Jerry's interpretation of this, and I want to bring up here U.S. v. Miller. And for the viewers, in 1939, the Supreme Court um, found that the Second Amendment does not confer a right to own a sawed-off shotgun absent some reasonable relationship to preserve the efficiency of a well-regulated militia. And this indicates that there's no individual right to possess firearms. What do you think of that interpretation? In the end, it doesn't matter so much what I think, because if I were to express my personal view, I would really be shooting myself in the foot. And the same thing applies, however, to the NRA position. It doesn't matter what we think about the Second Amendment. We don't have to know the first thing about the Second Amendment, or in the end, the second thing about the First Amendment. What counts is what the courts have to say about this. And what the courts have said in such cases as United States versus Miller in 1939 is that this is a collective right. And in the end, the Second Amendment does little but protect the states from um, uh, uh, to ensure that the states have uh, militias. That's about it. Now, we could debate precisely what happened in Miller, but really what happened was that an individual was arrested for possessing a shotgun. And um, uh, a federal judge said, yes, but the Second Amendment protects the right to have a shotgun. Therefore, the charges are going to be dismissed. And in the end, the United States Supreme Court unanimously decided, all the way back in 1939, 
no, that's not the case, and we're going to reinstitute the charges, and the charges were reinstituted. That's exactly what happened. Since then, the federal courts have interpreted the Second Amendment, perhaps in some way expanding on the Miller Doctrine to say that this is a collective right. And you'll notice that um, provisions such as the National Firearms Act, the Brady Bill, other provisions, they survive. They have not been stricken down as unconstitutional. Uh, and if we're talking about the power of the states, uh, we have to talk about a case that went before United States versus Miller, and that's Illinois versus Presser, decided by the Supreme Court in 1886, which held that um, uh, the point of the Second Amendment, and with its ambiguities that you were talking about, is that in the end, with the double passive, that the rights shall not be infringed, in the end, it's that Congress can't infringe the rights but the states have the power to have gun control legislation. And every state, pursuant to uh, that Supreme Court decision in 1886, has, has enacted one form or another of gun control legislation, which exists unto today. So my point is that the courts have already decided, um, expanding on the Miller case, which had a, a limited reasoning, and in fact, I think that the NRA would say, but that means that bazookas would be protected uh, under, under Miller because uh, that would be the sort of weapon used in the military or perhaps by a militia. But no, the courts have held, the lower courts have held uniformly, unanimously, that this is a collective right. It does not belong to the individuals. The Second Amendment does not protect the individual right to ownership, and indeed, con the proof that, uh, that, the, uh, that the courts have been fo uh, following that interpretation is that the gun control legislation that exists in our country survives and has not been found unconstitutional. Okay, that brings me to Emerson versus U.S., which I'm right. sure you're aware of, right. which in April of 1999, April 1999, a federal judge in Texas struck down part of a law that made it a felony for a person under the domestic restraining order to possess a firearm and rules that the right to bear arms is an individual right and not a right. collective right. And I want to ask both of you your views about this ruling given the fact that the decision sets the stage for a challenge of almost any law abridging an individual's um, right to possess a gun. First of all, uh, except felons and, and um, people who are mentally disabled. Nobody, uh, 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 that's not, that's, there's, that prohibition is still going to stand, but we said before we went on the air, um, we were talking about Emerson and, and my opinion on Emerson. First of all, I think uh, Judge Cummings is correct in what he says about the Second Amendment. And we filed an amicus brief in that case, and uh, several other p parties have. That's, there are going to be a, as many amici in that as there are pages in the decision. <clears throat> um, but ultimately, especially since this case is now before the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit has already ruled on a similar issue, the fact that a court is going to decline to, to uh, rule on a new constitutional issue when there's another issue before it. They've already decided in U.S. versus Lopez in the Fifth Circuit that a federal law, the Gun Free School Zones Act, does not apply because, <clears throat> because it, uh, what was done, Lopez had a gun and walked into the school. I, I, I think he was going in there, going, he was a student in the school. But he was arrested, they found the gun, and they said this is not interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court agreed, and uh, uh, it is my belief my expectation that the uh, Fifth Circuit, or there's a fair chance that the Fifth Circuit will decide this based upon Lopez rather than the Second Amendment. They may, they may decide it on the Second Amendment, but if I were a judge, uh, I would always duck issues if I could. And this is the, they've already got the Lopez precedent before them, so just as a procedural matter, uh, I think that they're going to decide it on the basis of Lopez rather than the Second Amendment. And Jerry, what are your views on this case? There are thousands of judges in the United States. In April 1999, one judge in Texas said that a provision of the Federal Violence Against Women's Act is unconstitutional because the individual who is charged with possessing a gun 
under circumstances evincing possible violence against a woman crossed state lines. And the judge, in uh, adopting the argument that the Second Amendment prohibits Congress from prosecuting individuals for possessing a gun, the judge accepted that argument. Um, since then, there have been four published opinions disagreeing with the judge, um, other than, I think, in the uh, Dred Scott case, which the United States Supreme Court decided uh, before the Civil War and was one of the things that led to the Civil War, I'm not certain that a single judge other than Judge Cummings, in fact, I'm almost certain that no judge other than Judge Cummings, except in the Dred Scott case, uh, found that there is a, a, a Second Amendment right to possess a gun or that it is unconstitutional to criminalize possessing a gun for the federal government to do so. In the Dred Scott case, what happened was that the majority decided that African Americans are not entitled to citizenship. And one reason that the Supreme Court said, along with imagine African Americans could assemble peaceably if they were to receive citizenship, is that, well, they might even have the right to possess guns. And wouldn't that be a terrible thing? Now, our thinking about the Second Amendment has evolved so deeply since the, since the uh, Civil War. Um, there's been the 14th Amendment and so many other cases. And of course, we talked about Presser versus Illinois. And we talked about um, um, uh, other cases as, as well. But Judge Cummings, in a very well, beautifully written opinion, actually talked about the Second Amendment and went through the roots. But in the end, however articulate Judge Cummings was, um, no doubt the Fifth Circuit on appeal will find a different reason if any reason at all is found to challenge the, um, to uphold a challenge against the Violence Against Women Act. And one basis is that the Supreme Court decided within the past few months ago, the case of United States versus Morrison. That was a five to four opinion finding that provisions of the Violence Against Women's Act uh, is uh, unconstitutional as violating the Commerce Clause and the, uh, the Enforcement Clause. It was a split opinion dealing with the power of the federal government versus the power of the states to enact certain legislation. But I think that the strong prediction, and I agree with Mr. Warner on this, is that if um, the decision in Emerson is upheld, it will be upheld on different grounds. And uh, I think that Mr. Warner would also agree with me that other than the dictum, the unimportant part of an opinion in the Dred Scott case, Judge Cummings was the first judge to articulate the concept which the NRA has, which has been in existence, I think, since 1860 or so. 1871. 1871. I think it's only been since 1960 or thereabouts that the NRA has, uh, has argued that the Second Amendment is an individual right. OK, well, another case that has spawned controversy lately was heard right here in Brooklyn mm -hmm. on February 11th, Hamilton versus Accutech. Right, right. And that case, there was an unprecedented verdict handed down which found the handgun industry liable mm -hmm. for an individual's criminal use of a gun on the grounds of negligent marketing. And many have compared this case or, you know, to the litigation of the states brought against the tobacco industry arguing neg negligent marketing practices. And my question to you is, do you think gun manufacturers have a reasonable duty of care to regulate gun distribution to prevent their criminal use? Uh, it, it is, uh, that's it's kind of a pregnant question, but um, first of all, with that, that's the million mom march. That's right, that's right. Um, a million pregnant moms. Uh, no, no, I don't believe in, in that sense because uh, they, are fed, they are heavily regulated by the federal government. They're heavily regulated by state governments. They're heavily, heavily regulated in New York City. And they comply with all of the regulations. They comply with all of the laws. And there is clear legal precedent for the proposition that you cannot be held responsible uh, to inquire as to what is hidden in the minds of those who, who purchase your product or what they intend to do with it or what will happen with uh, third-party consumers further down the line. In fact, there is a, a quote from uh, Holmes uh, along those lines. I can't give you the exact quote, but 
it was pertaining particularly to pistols, that a manufacturer or seller of pistols ought to be held responsible for the bad behavior of those who buy it, and that all of us have a right to depend upon uh, the good behavior of our neighbors. But there's another issue here that is totally apart from firearms or tobacco, and that is, how shall we make our laws? And that's, uh, the laws are supposed to be made in the legislative branch. And to, to go out and seek, first of all, and to seek third party liability, which courts have uniformly across the country rejected until they started with this tobacco and, and uh, Hamilton and cases like this. This is a nuance. Um, but if we're going to make law this way, if we're going to decide that the legislature has been irresponsible and that I am going to sue, there is no limit to who can be sued. Uh, perhaps I could sue although I live in, a, in, a, in an area that's very low in crime, but crime victims could come to me and retain me as their lawyer, and I could sue uh, the government schools of the city of Baltimore, for example, for failing to inculcate good character the way they did before. And I could, as, as my proof, show that crime rates at the turn of the century, when schools were differently uh, composed, uh, the crime rates were extremely low. Crime rates throughout the country were less than, the, the homicide rate was less than one per 100,000. So maybe I could use that as proof that the schools have failed. Or maybe I could sue, uh, maybe we could just have, uh, there's no end to who can be sued. And, and the real question is when are the courts going to say that this is a frivolity and give somebody a real stiff Rule 11 sanction and that will be the end of it because nobody <laughs> wants to wants to pay the kind of sanctions that uh, that you would pay if you brought a silly lawsuit in my court. Jerry, do you have a response? Sure. I think that educational malpractice claims are very different from a claim against the firearms industry that they're in fact violating the federal regulations in this heavily regulated area. Um, and while a manufacturer of guns may not be responsible for the bad behavior, as Mr. Warner put it, of some individuals, you think that one reason for having gun control is that there is some bad behavior on the part of individuals using guns. Um, the uh, decision in Hamilton versus Accutech decided right here in Brooklyn, um, I thought, uh, is, a, is, a, is a sound opinion. And you're right, it does create, in some respects, some novel precedent, but only in the sense that it that opinion, plus other lawsuits that are going on right now against gun manufacturers, as well as sentiment against gun manufacturers, uh, that opinion has held gun manufacturers responsible. Um, uh, otherwise, it is consistent with other opinions which have held uh, from time immor immemorial that um, if you're negligent, you can be sued civilly, absolutely. So um, uh, I think that the opinion was well-reasoned. Along the way, the, uh, the court decided that there is no individual right to, uh, uh, to possess a weapon, that the Second Amendment refers to a, a collective right, disagreeing with the uh, NRA's position. Um, and uh, I'm, I think that uh, in the nation, we can be proud of Hamilton versus Accutech. For so many years, the tobacco industry said, we are not responsible. We've been warning everybody what's going on. And all of a sudden, things are changing. Using laws that have been in existence for a very long time, juries are now starting to hold uh, tobacco manufacturers responsible. So it's just a matter of public opinion. Just as perhaps 200 years ago or more, many people in the United States believed that the Second Amendment truly conferred an individual right not a collective right. Now, things have changed very, very much. And people believe that uh, cigarette manufacturers should be held responsible for their, their dangerous products. And there have been many suits now, not just uh, the one before Judge Weinstein against gun manufacturers, but indeed, New York City has brought a suit against gun manufacturers. New York State has brought a suit against gun manufacturers. 
in Texas, where Judge Cummings is, Judge Weinstein is not in Texas, um, municipalities have brought suit against gun manufacturers, or at least one municipality has. So this is not an isolated thing. I expect that in the end, some people complain about lawyers because they're proactive and because they uh, are looking for a lot of money. Uh, I'm very fond of lawyers who can put an end to the dangers brought by tobacco and the dangers of negligent manufacturing and distribution of guns. Okay. You alluded to it a little bit, but a lot of these municipalities that are bringing suits against the gun manufacturers are saying that manufacturers should reimburse municipalities for the financial costs of handgun violence. And one of their theories is that the manufacturers can install trigger locks and smart technologies to permit only the owner to fire it. And my question is, are these measures consistent with the Second Amendment right to bear arms since the plaintiffs aren't calling for an outright ban on guns, just safety measures? First of all, uh, these are safety measures that are designed by somebody other than people who shoot guns a lot. Um, and as soon as they were designed, and as soon as they were proposed, and these laws started uh, 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 being proposed, and the lawsuits were filed, especially the, the settlement with Smith & Wesson, where Smith & Wesson decided they didn't want to sell the civilians anymore <coughs> and have alienated the whole gun community. Um, the the uh, first exemption, almost as soon as the ink was dry on this, was for law enforcement. Because, and I, I will use my example, I was, an, I was a Marine officer in Vietnam. I fired expert with the old Browning design, 1911 45. And when the time came to really uh, shoot at something besides paper targets, it, I had to try several times to get a round off because I was under stress. If you have, if you give a police officer a gun that is extremely complicated, a semi auto rather than a revolver, and say, here's a gun, I guarantee you 99% of the time it won't work. And when you need it, it might. He's not going to take it. And that's exactly what you're saying with this uh, so-called smart gun. That's like putting smart brakes on your car so that when somebody steals it, they'll only work when it recognizes his foot. That, that okay. is a stupid idea. Well, we're almost out of time. So I would like to thank both of you very much for coming and sharing your views. And I hope to get you back here to discuss these issues further because I had a lot more questions. So I'd like to thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. And for New York Law School, the Communications Media Center, and Media Reporter, this is Jennifer Tierney.